Hussein is rebuilding Iraq's military force and appears to be poised for revenge, as revealed in a disturbing report from Assignment now on BBC Two, which also contains scenes of an animal being dismembered and eaten alive. century's most resilient and resourceful tyrants. Saddam is defiant, determined and dangerous. Saddam is in possession of massive quantities of biological weapons. He's in possession of chemical weapons and he's in possession of missiles to deliver them. Saddam never forgets. Uh, when he is slighted, he gets back. Uh, he has never forgiven the Kuwaitis for having expelled him. He's never forgiven the United States for not allowing him to gobble up Kuwait. But today the smile is back on the face of the tiger. Saddam Hussein is staging a comeback. martyrs of Saddam, one army among many in Iraq, are a killing force. This is a regime that hunts its enemies down and that is not ashamed to broadcast its bloodlust on national television. A voracious regime whose servants are compromised by blood and not just by the blood of men. The Fedayeen, a force formed after the Gulf War for the regime's own protection, devour live wolves as greedily as the regime devours its own. Today, an increasing number of senior Iraqis are turning their backs on Saddam's brutality. Defectors like Brigadier Najib al-Salihi a man once in close contact with Baghdad's ruling circle is shedding new light on Saddam's house of horrors. Saddam is in the Arab people. He is in the Arab people in the work of non-traditional work. As it is. لمن الشعب إلى في صورة الجيش العراقي وعرف الجندي العراقي والجندي العراقي غير جاد في عمليات الإرهاب والتفتيش أو جاد تنظيم الفدائيين. The cruelty that is the hallmark of Saddam's regime was implanted in him in his childhood in Tikrit. Once an impoverished backwater, today the principal source of the armed might that underpins the regime, even at his birthday celebrations. Here, the young Saddam learned the Bedouin code of revenge and punishment in a loveless family where killing was a badge of courage. That code, carried to unprecedented extremes, is now enforced on legions of helpless Iraqis by the Tikriti clansmen who hold the regime together. Today, the provincial thug plots his revenge from a national stage. صدام دائم الانتقام من معارضيه وخاصة في القسم الجنوبي من العراق توجيهات القيادة العراقية للجيش هناك وللعناصر الأمنية أن يبادرون إلى قتل أي إنسان تبدو من عند معارضة للنظام بدون محاكمة من يثبت عند نشاط معارض بأي شكل من الأشكال يقتل ويرمى للكلاب السائدة 
six years after the invasion of Kuwait, Saddam Hussein is still in power, still defying United Nations inspectors, still building up his armed forces despite international sanctions, still murdering his own people with complete impunity. Today, the despair of ordinary Iraqis is deepened by the conviction that Western fecklessness and indecision are one of Saddam's strongest weapons, that it is not a question of whether he will strike again, but of where and when. On the 31st of August this year, Saddam sent his tanks into the northern Kurdish region the Allies had promised to protect. Allied planes patrolling the no-fly zone held their fire as Iraqi ground troops, followed by Saddam's secret police, advanced into the Kurdish capital, Erbil. It was not a full-scale return to northern Iraq, closed to Saddam's forces ever since the Kurds rebelled in 1991, but a small window of opportunity offered by a Kurdish civil war. Saddam's men remained in Erbil for three days, searching house to house for opponents of the regime from temporary headquarters in the Kurdish parliament building, the symbol of the Kurds' rebellion and subsequent self-rule, and, inevitably, one of Saddam's first targets. But on this occasion, Saddam concentrated his revenge on Iraqi Arabs, political opponents who established offices like this in the Kurdish safe haven set up by the Gulf War allies. Today, all that remains of their dreams are the personal belongings they abandoned as the nightmare returned and they were led to interrogation and death. High on a hill, fast against the Turkish border, with nowhere left to run, we found the survivors of the Iraqi National Congress, the Western-backed opposition coalition, the West abandoned in its hour of need. Almost two months after Saddam violated the Kurd safe haven, armed with lists of INC members, these INC families are still waiting, terrified, for safe passage out of a region that was never given the support it needed to thrive. Their conditions are wretched. We are afraid because all of the INC uh, stay in this place. And in any moment, Saddam may send anybody and putting TNT and all of us who are like, He's very clever, but he's very criminal. Two submachine guns to protect 210 people are the only reminder that the INC was once a fighting force, encouraged to believe it could roll the Iraqi army back to Baghdad from its base in liberated Kurdistan. Today, the paralysis of the men of the INC is a faithful reflection of the paralysis of Western policy towards Iraq. A policy whose slogans evaporated like smoke when Saddam's tanks turned not on oil-rich Kuwaitis, but on helpless Iraqis. Today, these people wait to be rescued, still raw with the memory of the massacre their ragtag army suffered just south of Erbil. <laughs> وثق الايادي وفورا تعدم بعد ان نعدموا انا كنت مختفي في احد بيوت قرى اكراد فاجى احد اشخاص الاكراد الموجودين قريبين على ساحه المعركه فقال توجد جثث اي ان سي مقاتلي ان سي تقدر باكثر من 100 شخص وجات سيارات عسكريه وحملوها ونقلوها الى داخل العراق after overrunning the INC's front lines under the eyes of Allied planes, Iraqi troops surrounded their offices in Erbil. لقيتهم كتفين الأيادي إلى الخلف مشدود عيونهم وصعدوهم في سيارة 
اجت بعد السيارتين كوستر مظللة It was near the Kurdish parliament on a bleak expanse of wasteland that groups of prisoners were taken and shot dead. Today Iraqi armor is gone from Erbil, but INC survivors are convinced that Saddam's secret police remain behind. When we were walking down the street, I saw two men working with the Iraqi intelligence. I know them, they are from my uh, hometown in Basra. They pointed at us. Yeah. And you're looking for everyone who is against Saddam Hussein. Saddam's armor is already poised for the next probe of Western resolve, for the next advance into the disintegrating democracy that was one of the Allies' proudest achievements. We warned about Saddam's build-up. We warned about the movement of his troops very early on over 10 days before the invasion took place. We were aware of all those things. And we were encouraged by the statement from the White House that came 48 hours before the invasion that the United States had warned Saddam. And we thought that this was sufficient grounds to believe that there will be action to prevent him and deter him from entering Erbil. But there was no action. So Saddam moved north, and the wall of fire that separated the Kurdish region from the rest of Iraq came down. Today, the roads are open. At first glance, it seems as if life in Erbil is back to normal. In this busy little market town, there are no public signs of private panic. But the unfamiliar sight of Saddam's face on Iraqi dinars printed in Baghdad proves that Iraqi Arabs are back. Fears that Saddam's secret police are not far behind his traders are deepened with every sighting of a car licensed in cities where Saddam and his henchmen hold sway. Before Saddam's tanks entered Erbil, his front line had been south of the 36th parallel. We wanted to visit Koshtepe, site of the INC massacre. But we were stopped on the edge of Erbil at a checkpoint manned by Saddam's erstwhile allies. We argued in vain for almost an hour. Then a Kurdish man traveling from Koshtepe stopped his car and drew me aside. Others told us Saddam's army is not just in Koshtepe. It's in Koshtepe Karadiz Bestana, 12 miles inside the 36th parallel. The situation in the north is far from settled. It is still fluid, and one can expect surprises. After all, the United States is not the only power operating in the north. There are many other powers operating, and the situation is not settled. So, and I fear that this can only play into uh, Saddam's hands, because the more the KDP is under pressure, the more they are compelled to rely on Saddam. Saddam Hussein also exacts his revenge outside his borders. The Jordanian capital, Amman, is, for the vast majority of those who live here, a haven of tranquility. But more than a hundred thousand Iraqis have fled and settled in Jordan since the Allies abandoned the popular uprising they called for and Saddam suppressed. Most of them are illegal immigrants who lead miserable lives in constant fear of deportation back to Iraq.
But these hapless exiles have a far deeper fear than the Jordanian police. The Iraqi agents Saddam has sent abroad. In Jordan, Iraqi defectors wanted by Baghdad have been killed and kidnapped on streets just like this. This is a murky world where destitute fugitives spy on each other and shadows dog every step. Mohammed Rujab was a major in Saddam's special forces. He fled Iraq after being sentenced to death for opposing the invasion of Kuwait. He has been repeatedly threatened by Iraqi agents, by Iraqi diplomats on one occasion, for documenting human rights abuses like the murder of this old woman's eight sons. Exile does not mean safety, nor an end to grief. They threatened my family, my children. They they told me, listen, if you're not afraid, we know that you're, you're, you think you're, you're tough or things like this, but we can hurt you with your family. You have two children, you should take care of them. You have a family you should take care of. You shouldn't do these things. The Jordanian government has recently expelled a number of Iraqi diplomats. But Saddam's agents still work out of companies like this to circumvent international sanctions and monitor opposition activities. These guys work undercover. I mean, they work uh, in companies, mainly in commercial business. Their first priority is buying weapons, uh, weapons in all sorts of ways to Iraq. Uh, they have their Jordanian agents. They have companies uh, that uh, buy parts for non-conventional weapons who are still being built in Iraq and constructed in Iraq. Their second priority is going after the Iraqis here. This company is now under investigation by the Jordanian authorities, accused of importing spare parts for military helicopters. Its men were certainly reluctant to face our cameras and became increasingly agitated as we waited outside the building. Then, when we finally left, they came after us and attempted to seize our film. the international community is the invisible face. The weapons of mass destruction and especially the biological weapons the Iraqi regime has gone to exceptional lengths to hide. So important are weapons like this to Saddam Hussein that he has forfeited at least 75 billion dollars in oil revenue by refusing to surrender them. United Nations weapons inspectors have been crawling all over Iraq for the past five years in the most intrusive inspection regime ever devised. And yet a UN report to be published later this week says highly significant quantities of banned weapons remain concealed. Iraq's final declaration is incomplete, inaccurate, unsubstantiated and unsupported. In the safe house of an Iraqi opposition group in Jordan, we found first-hand evidence of the way Iraq is deceiving the UN inspectors. Oh. 
Our informant, who fled from Baghdad only a few weeks ago, was an Iraqi colonel who served at a military base with links to Saddam's biological warfare program. Baghdad initially relied on tip-offs from agents like this government translator to keep one step ahead of UN inspectors. But now the UN makes surprise inspections and with no time for concealment access is simply denied as the inspector's own film shows. It's a crude ploy, but it's effective. We're being prevented from taking video of the Baghdad military complex. Just hold your ground. There are armed guards. Do not stop videotaping. You take your hand off my inspector now. You do not touch my inspector. I don't touch him. You're touching me. If you touch me once more, In 1991, Allied troops lived in fear of attack from chemical weapons. Today, the UN is still concerned about VX, Saddam's most toxic nerve gas, as well as biological agents, the most easily manufactured weapons of mass destruction in the world. Saddam produced 8,500 litres of anthrax, a hardy organism that is more deadly than any chemical agent and that causes suffering like this. A lethal dose of anthrax fits onto a needle tip. He also produced 19,000 liters of botulinum toxin, which causes its victims to choke to death. A millionth of an ounce of botulinum is enough to kill. And then there was aflatoxin, a cancer-causing agent, hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, a virus that makes eyeballs bleed, and many others. How extensive was Saddam's BW program? Well, it's probably the most extensive program that we know about in the West uh, uh, ever in recent times, since the Second World War. They had a range of biological weapons agents from uh, viruses, bacteria, they even used products of fungus, and even uh, uh, agents which attack crops. How close did we come to biological war in 1991? I think we were very close because the weapons were deployed in the hands of commanders who had delegated authority to use them. Iraq claims that 166 bombs and 25 missiles filled with biological agents were destroyed after the Gulf War. But the UN found work on anthrax and botulinum continuing at this facility in the Iraqi desert. Al-Hakam, Saddam's most important biological warfare plant, was neither bombed by the Allies nor spotted by spy planes. The chickens were part of a cover put in place after the war. Among the officials insisting that Al-Hakam was quite harmless was Dr. Tahari Hab, a British-trained scientist now identified as one of Saddam's top biological warfare specialists. You can see this site is uh, a civilian site uh, and, uh, established near many different, uh, another establishment and uh, all the activity civilians, nothing uh, serious. This dual purpose machinery could have been for civilian use. Although these double-jacketed fermenters needed to grow toxic agents 
were so strong they later had to be destroyed with explosives seized from Saddam's nuclear program. It is a protein used for animal feed and uh, we have also a biofertilizer. Biofertilizer, it is like any fertilizer, you add it to the soil to enhance the productivity of soil, but it is from micro uh, biological origin. But the UN inspectors had failed to account for 17 tons of biological growth medium, imported not in the usual small quantities, but in 50 gallon drums. 17 tons was imported by the Ministry of Health for uh, medical appliances, for their purposes, and nothing to do with this factory. But they imported for their use, for medical purposes, for cultures, and uh, you know, for their use, not for ours. But it was for theirs. Eleven of the 17 missing tons were eventually discovered at Al Hakam. The growth media was rendered useless and then dumped in deep pits. This year, Al Hakam itself was destroyed. Severely damaging, but not necessarily ending, Saddam's biological program. He could reconstitute it today. He has the ta scientific and technological talent to be able to do that. And by the very nature of the biological weapons program, it can be produced in any number of facilities, ranging from a dairy factory through to a medical laboratory and a university, or in any number of places. Iraq has never halted its work on the development of missiles to deliver its weapons of mass destruction. These gyroscopes, guidance systems for missiles, were discovered late last year buried in the Tigris River. Imported from Russia, they came from the SS-18, the longest-range ballistic missile in the former Soviet inventory, capable of delivering ten warheads from the heartland of the Soviet Union to the heartland of the United States. We do not know for sure that all of those gyroscopes were found. We do not know for sure that there were not other gyroscopes imported. But what all of this shows is that Saddam continues to seek uh, to manufacture long-range ballistic missiles. He has never given up, and his research teams are hard at work today. And so the search continues. A mission expected to last only a few months has already lasted five full years and still with no end in sight. For somewhere in these vast expanses, lethal chemical and biological agents and the missiles to deliver them remain concealed. The amount of agent was enough lethal doses to uh, destroy the Earth population. Uh, several times over. So potentially Iraq can threaten the region uh, if, uh, and threaten the well-being and lives of the individuals, of uh, the inhabitants in the cities, the great cities in the, in the region. For the moment, the region's best protection against Saddam Hussein is not the avalanche of arms peddled to it since the Gulf War, but the American ground troops left behind to deter Saddam's aggression. But it was troops like these that thwarted Saddam's imperial ambitions in 1991. Today, they themselves are a potential target. Saddam never forgets. Uh, when he is slighted, he gets back. Uh, he has never forgiven the Kuwaitis for having expelled him. He's never forgiven the United States for not allowing him to gobble up Kuwait. It was from bases like this in Saudi Arabia that the Allies drove Saddam from Kuwait in 1991. The bomb was left at a security checkpoint where it exploded to devastating effect. This attack on a military housing complex in Dharan killed 19 U.S. servicemen in June. Five Americans had already died in the Saudi capital, Riyadh. The three-story building housing the American servicemen was all but destroyed. Many of the soldiers were trapped in the wreckage, 
badly injured, they had to be dug out of the rubble by their colleagues. At least one hitherto unknown group has already claimed responsibility. That group was the Tigers of the Gulf. Saddam is heavily involved in terrorist activities in Saudi Arabia now. He trains Saudis on explosives and terrorism. We had a report long before these explosions from sources that we had in Mosul that a group called the Tigers of the Gulf were being trained in Mosul on explosions and terrorist tactics. In northern Iraq? In northern Iraq. And he particularly feels that Saudi Arabia had been the base from which he was humiliated. And he is not about to forget that. He is going to extract his revenge as he goes on. And Saddam has the capacity to, ex to be satisfied quietly with the results of his revenge. He does not feel the need to broadcast that he has done it. In 1991, Saddam formed a special committee to plan terrorist actions against the Allies. Soon after, Mohammed Rijab was put in charge of a terrorist unit where he trained men from five countries. These units were trained uh, to do special operations uh, using uh, dynamite, sabotage, uh, using uh, silences. Uh, they also were trained uh, to speak languages of other countries, such as Iranian, uh, Turkish, Israeli, and accents of other countries, countries and also English. In February 1993, a car bomb exploded in an underground garage at New York's World Trade Center, killing six and injuring more than a thousand. The blast came in the middle of Ramadan, the month of fasting during which the Quran forbids Muslims to wage war. But America, rocked to its foundations, had little doubt where the blame lay. In the panic that ensued, it escaped notice that the occasion was the second anniversary of the Allies' defeat of Saddam Hussein. The attack on the World Trade Center was meant to topple New York's tallest tower onto its twin, causing thousands of deaths. It was an ambitious conspiracy, blamed so far on a loose and amateurish group of Islamic fundamentalists with no ties to any state. Yet there are indications of state involvement, and that state is Iraq. Pictures broadcast on Iraqi television show the extent of Saddam's antagonism towards America. And there are strong indications that in the World Trade Center bombing, Saddam grabbed the opportunity to build on foundations laid by others. In the aftermath of the Gulf War, his own resources were temporarily reduced. And so it seems he took over an existing operation and made it his own. The plot originally began small time in New York. One of the plotters had a terrorist uncle in Baghdad, and as that plot, the small town plot, began among the fundamentalists in New York, he made many, many calls to his uncle in Baghdad. Um, soon after that, two people came who are, are, were the two fugitives um, in the plot. What, both of them had Iraqi connections. One of them, a fellow by the name of Abdul Rahman Yassin, was an Iraqi. He came from Baghdad, and he returned to Baghdad. Abdul Rahman Yassin, accused of being one of the bomb makers, fled America within days of the bombing. Yassin's neighbors in Baghdad say he has always worked for Iraqi intelligence and is away from Iraq for months on end, often in the Pakistani capital, Islamabad. Ramzi Youssef, considered the mastermind of the bombing, was arrested in Islamabad last year. And the second person who came after the calls to Baghdad was Ramzi Youssef. He arrived on an Iraqi passport, which was tailor-made for him. Uh, interestingly, Yusuf is not a, an Arab. He is of an ethnic group with close ties to Iraqi intelligence, the Baluch, who live in western Pakistan, eastern Iran. The Iraqis used them during the Iran-Iraq war to open up a front, a terrorist front, against Iran in the east of the country. So Yusuf is a Baluch, and they have ties to Iraqi intelligence. 
And finally, I think most significantly, Yusuf is not a fundamentalist. He has an entirely different background. Um, he didn't have a beard when he was arrested, no Korans, no Islamic literature. And the government, even during the trial, uh, played a sound file from his computer. And it's a file, sound file of his uh, girlfriend, his Asian woman, cooing to him, remember that I love you, and Yusuf replying to her. It's not a fundamentalist to me. Saddam Hussein looks triumphant today, emboldened by Washington's obsession with Iran, and cheered on by an Arab world in revolt against Western double standards. Saddam is a lot stronger today than he was two or three years ago. Frankly, anybody who says Saddam Hussein is in a box uh, is smoking something. Uh, it's absolutely uh, contrary to reality. Uh, Saddam Hussein has demonstrated very clearly by moving into northern Iraq uh, that he can move three armored divisions. We will do nothing. Uh, I firmly believe that Saddam's next move is against Kuwait. Uh, Saddam Hussein has never given up his ambitions to control Kuwait. He has never uh, been satisfied in his desire for revenge against Kuwait. I fully expect him to make a move towards Kuwait, and we need to have a coherent policy to deter him. In 1990, Kuwait's ruling Asabah family escaped over the border in the first hours of the invasion and as free men demanded the liberation of their rich but vulnerable city-state. Their return to Kuwait was a cause for celebration. But despite the appearance of business as usual, anxieties still run deep. And with good reason, Saddam's generals have been told to get it right next time. <laughs> وجه إلى كل القيادات العراقية اللي اشتركت في الكويت بوضع دراسات مفصلة عن أهم الدروس اللي برزت خلال الحرب فالتفكير العراقي الجديد هو بالتنسيق مع القوات الخاصة مع أجهزة تأمين المعلومات مع قيادة طيران الجيش لوضع خطة محكمة تطبق حال الشروع باحتلال الكويت ثانية بحيث تؤمن مسك العناصر القيادية في الكويت وخاصة من عائلة الصباح. Two brigades of elite Republican guards and a mechanized division have been sent to the south since the Allies allowed Saddam into Erbil. New roads have been opened, fuel and ammunition prepositioned. The coalition that liberated Kuwait in 1991 is in tatters. Saddam Hussein's army is leaner but meaner than it was in 1990. And his skill at playing one tribe off against another strengthens his chances of surviving despite splits in his inner circle. This brutish man has jerked tens of thousands of Western troops halfway across the world and still threatens the Gulf. His Gulf neighbors have seen America abandon northern Iraq and must fear that it may, under pressure, redefine its priorities once again. Only Saddam Hussein is holding his ground, unbowed and unforgiving.